with me now to tell us a little bit about the letter he's written and indeed about the report and the historical context as well. Eugene, good morning to you. Good morning, Wendy. So, so I know probably like so many people, Eugene, you've probably um, scanned some of the report. It's quite a long report. What's your first uh, reaction to it? Have, has this commission done a good job? Uh, in places it has. Uh, I found significant errors in it where they haven't done a very good job. Uh, and I'm still working on it at the moment, but preliminary, it looks like uh, they concentrated on the high infant mortality and drew assumptions on that which are not valid. For example, if you take St. Vincent Hospital, recently it was reported that it has a very high mortality rate for cardiac problems. So if you saw that St. Vincent Hospital had high mortality rates for a particular condition, you might be very reluctant to go near that hospital thinking that it has providing very poor care. But the, that's, uh, the statistics can be misleading. It turns out that the high mortality rate in St. Vincent's is due to the fact that it has a cardiac specialist unit. And cardiac patients are sent from all the other hospitals there. And if there is a bad outcome, it happens in St. Vincent's. Not, it's recorded as happening in St. Vincent's, not in the previous hospital. So where's the correlation, Eugene, in, in your eyes between that and the high infant mortality rate uh, in some of these homes? Yeah, you see, there, there's a, um, a logical fallacy that, that naturally occurs within statistics. It's called in the trade, uh, correlation does not imply causation. So if there's a correlation between two different statistics, it doesn't mean one is caused in the other. Because there was high, morta- high infant mortality in the uh, mother and baby homes, it was due to the fact that they were dealing with a, a high risk cohort in society and also the, um, there's a hospital effect. Hospitals always have a higher mortality rate than say in the home because that's where most sick people are uh, collected. You know? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so <coughs> it's, it's trying to connect the two. I know you wrote to the Taoiseach Meal Martin. What did you say in your letter, Eugene? Well, uh, I said to him, you know, this, uh, you want to get this report checked out first before you start making assumptions on it. I have in front of me here what happened in the Bethany home, which kicked all this, uh, this off uh, in, in 2012 when a group of people made a presentation to the minister. I think it was Rory Quinn at the time. And it started off where Mary Lou MacDonald said that people were starved to death. That is by, from the term, use of the term Erasmus on death, cert- death certificates. And many other politicians have said the children were starved to death in mother and baby homes. Now, the mother and baby home commission, to their credit, have said that isn't the case. Marasmus is not starvation, and they got the advice of a paediatrician to um, confirm that. So in terms of, I, ca- I suppose, just the broader context, Eugene, and I know um, for so many who have read even some of the testimonies, um, the attitude towards mothers and unplanned pregnancy and the, the suffering that they endured, um, it, it, it's, it's hard to maybe accept this part of our history. But you think it should be put in a historical context, but we can't really ne- negate the pain that many are feeling at this present time. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's dangerous to go near and talk about the survivors' uh, feelings, but I'm sticking directly to the history and to what the statistics tell us. And the statistics tell us um, things that are different to what is is appearing in the papers at the moment. Um, you see now. The, um, the attitude to unmarried mothers was there, there's no doubt about it. There was a negative attitude towards them. And when you go back in history, you'll find that that was deliberate that it only starts in the middle of the 19th century. And that is because the, the government and the, the churches were trying to reduce the amount of unwanted children that were appearing on the streets. They were uh, abused in all sorts of unspeakable ways. So these homes were set up as a way of uh, taking these unfortunates in and giving them a life and setting them on the correct path in life, if you like. Uh, the conditions which prevailed in the past uh, and the language used is easily misunderstood by us today. Uh, for example, people in hospitals were called inmates. We tend to equate that with prison, but that isn't what they, were, they meant at the time. And the commission got caught out badly in some of the old legislation where it, it, it didn't realize that what they were calling maternity homes are not what we would regard as maternity homes now. So they were, there was a big issue at the time with what was called baby farming. And that was that women would have their babies 
they would pay another woman to look after it and rear it and they would pay either a weekly fee a lump sum or a monthly fee to have the baby looked after very often what was happening is the babies weren't being well looked after and sometimes they were deliberately killed this was particularly uh, a big problem in England and the last woman baby farmer was uh, Rhonda Willis and she was hung in 1907 for the murder of infants she's the last woman I think it was 1917 when the last baby farmer was convicted and sentenced to death in Sweden uh, Hilda Neeson was her name so this was a big problem that was lasting for, for centuries and anything this seemed to do was ineffective and the other problem is that when was many babies were abandoned these were called foundings and they would wind up in places like the mother and baby homes <coughs> very often they'd be found in bad condition and they would die uh, before they could be fed and nourished and all the rest of it so they found their way into the mother and baby homes. So they also found their way into these statistics. And the statistics will, that's why you have high death rates at these places. That was missed by the uh, Commission of Investigation. One of the things that the report makes clear, and you've touched on your own kind of understanding of it, Eugene, yourself, is the societal attitude and, and, and you've given your insights into where you think that may have um, derived its place from, but, uh, and it makes clear that, you know, these women weren't forced into these homes, that their families sent them there, but many commentators would say that it was also a window into a, a kind of patriarchal, misogynistic culture, not just in Ireland, this is something that happened in countries, uh, in many other countries, um, for a long time. Do you come to that conclusion from the data? Uh, misogynist is, 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 is a term that's overused at the moment and everybody is keen to pull that out. It's not the case. If you look very carefully at court records and how women were dealt with who murdered their own children, they were dealt with with great compassion. And even though some of them were sentenced to death because that was the only sentence uh, open to them, the jury often pleaded for mercy and they were often, their sentences commuted and they were released from prison for very shortly after. So it treated women very well. And, but it's a common notion that has built up from the feminist movement, I think, in Ireland at the moment, that everybody was misogynist. It isn't. But these um, women in particular, Eugene, in these homes, um, suffered a huge amount of emotional distress, um, while the men who made them pregnant often got on with them lives. Absolutely. Well, that's the one good thing, is that they're finally looking at the men and blaming the men for their actions. It was the men who put them in there. There's no doubt about it. And these were cads, if you like. These were people who just, as soon as they heard the word, I'm pregnant, disappeared. And... Um, but some of them did and some of them got married and even in my day a lot of people there was a lot of what we used to call shotgun weddings uh, where a lot of men did own up and they would get married and many of them went on to have long successful relationships afterwards so you have to put a bit of balance into it as well and what about that do we know much about because uh, presumably not all women who had unplanned pregnancies outside of marriage ended up in mother and baby homes that's true the 57,000 figure has been banded about about the amount of women that went through the mother and baby homes. Or the, the births of them were 57,000 births. But I've calculated out that there was a further 200,422 births that were not in mother and baby homes. Now the commission has said that they thought there was about 25,000 in other county homes. That means the vast majority of illegitimate children were looked after by their parents or grandparents and indeed the Commission admit that. They say that the grandparents, particularly the grandmother, would take in back the daughter and the child and rear the child. And I, uh, I first-hand experience of that. And I know in places a lot of uh, illegitimate children found out they were illegitimate when they went for their birth cert. They had no idea. They thought, their mother, they thought their mother was their aunt and their granny was their mother. And things like that. And there are very, very good stories. There's a lot of other good stories missing as well about the amount of people who took uh, um, children out of these homes and uh, and looked after them in terms of adoption. They didn't have to do adoption, but foster them and give them a good life. Some foster parents were as bad as others, but we have that even today with the Grace uh, uh, story, where uh, a, a poor, unfortunate child, disabled child, was left for 11 years in an abusive household. So mistakes that happened in the past happen today. Do you think that we've we, learned from those mistakes, Eugene? No, if you look at the amount of money that totally gets to um, look after it, it is spending, it reports on the paper from time to time, one million euro per child per year. 
is some of the figures of what they're doing, and they're saying these are deeply disturbed individuals. And they're doing that with 21st century knowledge. In 20th century, they didn't have that knowledge, and they certainly didn't have that kind of money. And if you take the money that uh, Tugger spends per per year on a child, it's something like €6,000 per, ch- per child, per year per child. The equivalent of what they were spending in June was £35 uh, a week, I think. Well, that's the £10, shillings. well, £35 a week, yeah. So from 6000 a week is what we're paying now, they were paying £35 a week. Mm. That kind of puts it into perspective. That's in modern terms now. Yeah, we are. You yeah. do it with 35 euro, sorry, 35 euro. Yeah, well, Eugene, thank you so much just for giving us a little bit of the kind of historical background and context yeah. to to a very long and inst- extensive report. Thanks for joining us on the programme today. That's Eugene Jor- Jordan, historian and author, giving us some of his thoughts on the mother and baby homes reports. We'll be talking about it more again in the next hour with Senator Ronan Mullen as well. Music now from Life.